So Scott gave me the <coughs> honor of closing and talking about not just about these last two papers, but maybe talking a little bit more broadly about at least what I've learned, um, really more as a theorist, about you know, an inequality and human capital investment and all these things in terms of market design. So affirmative action, particularly in the context of college admissions, is one of the most divisive public policy issues I've ever seen. Um, I'm sure that Al could tell us about more divisive issues, but um, in the context of the uh, United States, like we've seen multiple Supreme Court cases, including my own institution of the University of Texas, which has now come back from the Supreme Court for the second time. There have been a string of voter initiatives, most famously Prop 209 in California, which basically outlawed affirmative action in public school, university, and missions. Of course, it's not clear if that has actually had that effect. Um, if you listen to Tim Grossclose and others who have studied these issues. And of course, there have been multiple now private lawsuits uh, against Harvard and other institutions claiming discrimination, sometimes against the, uh, the non-disadvantaged minority of Asian Americans who they, there's claims of discrimination against them by these institutions. So, and as Brent pointed out, this debate has really always assumed a fixed pie. We have so many seats at Harvard, so many seats at Northern Illinois University, so many seats at the University of Chicago. And if we give more of those, if we give more of those seats to African American applicants or low socioeconomic status applicants, we perforce must give less of those seats to Asian American uh, applicants or white applicants. And what Brent does in his paper is he points out this is not the entire story. We should not actually think about this pie is completely fixed because when you start changing who gets these seats and what the competition for these seats looks like, what it really means is you're changing the incentives for investing in human capital. That suddenly these seventh grader, these Mormon seventh graders in Utah, but more generally African American applicants or applicants of low socioeconomic status, you've changed their incentives for investing in human capital. So, Affirmative action can ameliorate the discouragement effect for disadvantaged students, and you can see a, uh, a shrinking of the racial achievement gaps. So that sounds great, and it sounds like this is a good tool we can use against inequality, but now let's think if we're on the other side of that affirmative action debate, the theory at least tells us that this can also exacerbate the discouragement effect for non-preferred students, for the students who are not getting the set-asides or what have you, and so now, in fact, you might worry that this is only going to make the debate more divisive. Because if I'm a parent of someone who's a non-preferred student, well, now you're telling me not only are you going to make it harder for me to get in, my kid into the University of Chicago, but you're also going to weaken my incentives to get my kid to actually study and not play on his Xbox. And so, well, I think what Brent points out is really interesting. It's not clear to me that we want to think of an affirmative action as a way of sort of reducing achievement gaps because it's, going, it's still going to have these same kinds of tensions. But it opens up a whole new set of questions about well, what kind of you know, allocations should we think about to maximize overall human capital investment. If we think that human capital investment has big positive externalities, which seems a reasonable assumption, then does affirmative action sort of lead to more overall human capital investment, less? Are there other tournament structures that we could think about that would maybe enhance human capital investment more? I don't know, I don't study tournaments, but I think this would be a great place for people who do study tournaments and do market design, more generally, to start thinking about how do we want to allocate these seats, to think about investment by students before they go to college. And this actually shows up in, this, in a similar way um, in Coniglia's talk. So they point out affirmative action can actually be a matter of efficiency. So need-based aid was actually more effective at recruiting high-quality students than merit-based aid. And these high-performing, low-income uh, low students seem to be under-recruited by places like Franklin and Marshall relative to their high-income peers. So affirmative action here is really about finding the best students. So these Pell Grant recipients actually seem to be as good as the rest of the Franklin and Marshall class and allows them to sort of improve their entire class. And that is a much easier argument to make in a public forum saying, look, we're not you know, trying to advantage Pell Grant recipients or those from lower socioeconomic status. 
We're trying to find the students that we think we can do the best job of teaching who we're going to make the most successful. And that's an argument that sort of goes across the political spectrum and makes this kind of affirmative action very compelling. Um, most importantly, I thought from reading the paper, what I really want to hear more about was these postgraduate outcomes for Franklin and Marshall students. So they seem to be as good, if not better, for the Pell Grant recipients than for, uh, than for their usual student body. I, having talked to Alan now, I found out, well, we can't really see what's happened five years out because this has only happened, started happening, well, I guess nine years ago, and so they're only one year out now. But I really look forward to seeing this work as it goes forward and goes forward to other colleges and seeing can we actually take these high-performing, low-income students now that maybe if we're getting better at identifying them, can we actually see them succeed long term? Um, and as I said before, they argue that affirmative action can really be seen as raising the overall surplus, that we're going out and finding these best students. We're just having to use a little bit more effort to go out and talk to KIPP and talk to other places and like that to find these students. OK. But what I thought was really interesting about both of these talks was they both wanted to talk about what I might call ex-ante investment. So how the market design of college admissions changes the investment decisions of the institutions in that market before the market takes place. So it changes the institutions um, in the affirmative action case by changing human capital investment decisions and in the other case by changing the decisions of maybe these high-performing, low-income students, but also maybe changing the decisions of the colleges. You know, maybe they should go out and invest more in providing information to these low-income students to tell them that Franklin and Marshall, yeah, maybe you've never been to rural Pennsylvania, but it's a place where you can really actually grow. OK. So if affirmative action is just shifting around number of seats, we're pretty much doomed. That's a black hole of a debate, as we found out over the past 25 or more years. But these authors' works really open a whole new set of questions about affirmative action and pre-market investment and thus efficiency. So how do we design college admissions to maximize these human capital investments? What can we do to sort of you know, get students to induce students to make, you know, to not play on the Xbox, but more generally to make you know, the things that are, you know, to invest in human capital in a way that'll make them successful? Um, how do we improve information provision in these markets? So a lot of the markets we've heard talked about today, not just these, although the college is, uh, market is a great example, how do we provide information to market participants, particularly the socioeconomically disadvantaged? Because not only does this have the direct effect, which a lot of people have commented on, a lot of the speakers have commented on, that it gets people to take advantage of the opportunities that are available to them, but it also changes their behavior even before they come to the market in a way that might be socially efficient. In the case of college, it might even get them if I know, you know, even in ninth grade, that Franklin and Marshall is a place that could, you know, I could go and prosper. Well, maybe that's going to change my behavior in ninth grade. I'm going to try and, you know, make sure to work harder in my history class or what have you. And then, again, how does providing merit-based aid change incentives for human capital investments? If my worry as a ninth grader is there's no way my family's ever going to be able to pay for college, well, if I know there are places like Franklin and Marshall and other institutions of higher learning that have strong merit-based aid programs, then maybe I can hope that I will, in fact, be able to pay for college, and that will change my behavior ex ante. So more generally, I think a lot, of what, a lot of what the talks here have sort of spoken to me about is the importance of thinking about how market design, particularly in these markets, has big impacts on ex ante investment. So many, many of the papers here talked about the importance of market design on pre-market behavior. So one of the speakers talked about coffee and the fact that we really had trouble designing the markets for coffee, and that led to a lot of really bad ex-ante investment decisions by coffee growers. So we didn't see investment in human capital about how to learn how to store the coffee and all the things you do to coffee. I don't know. I don't drink much coffee. And, the, and they also in a lack of physical investment. They didn't buy these washing machines, which we can make the coffee of a higher quality. Uh, we saw, I saw that there was a great example in Canis's talk about food allocation. Well, what happened once the food banks in the rural areas knew that they could actually get food, even if it wasn't the most uh, valuable food? Well, they started investing in food trucks. 
Because suddenly now there was a market and it was valuable to have a food truck because if you're in rural Idaho, you could go to Boise or go to Seattle to pick up that entire truckload worth of dairy products, which you really needed right then, even though dairy in his, in his food bank example actually doesn't cost that much in terms of shares. And then finally, we saw a lot of talk about allocating of teachers. And again, if teachers know that they're going to be remunerated for teaching, for doing a good job teaching on the south side of Chicago, well, maybe then teachers are going to invest more in learning how to teach low-income students as opposed to saying, look, I know in my career, I know, you know, I really want to go to Winnetka or Nutrier because I get paid basically the same amount, so I'm going to specialize in teaching the people who live in Nutrier. Um, I actually have some similar work on this looking at uh, school choice mechanisms and how it induces schools to think differently about how they want to invest in their, uh, in the services they provide to different types of students. Um, and of course, this idea actually shows up in auction theory a lot. There's a whole set of papers where we think about, well, if we change the auction design, how is that going to change the incentives for agents before they even come to the auction to make these sort of pre-auction investments? OK. So human capital investment is obviously one of the most, if not the most important decisions we make in our life. And moreover, it has huge externalities in that the more people invest, you know, Scott or Sonia or whoever investing in human capital makes my life a lot better. Um, Scott particularly, as it turns out. Uh, so, <laughs> so if we want to understand and improve human capital investment, we're going to need to explicitly consider how the design of markets affects investment incentives for such investment. If I want people to make sort of good human capital, strong human capital investments, Tomorrow, I'm going to need to design markets which are going to give them good incentives for doing that today. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of markets that we've seen talked about at this conference that are going to do that. So we've talked a lot about labor markets. Again, you can imagine, you know, the better, the more efficient the labor market, the better the human capital investments are going to be. We've talked about goods markets like the market for coffee. Sort of if we had better market design, there are better mechanisms for, you know, making sure that coffee growers got rewarded and that, uh, gro thank you, Scott and uh, coffee roasters got rewarded, we would see better investment on both sides of that market. With housing markets, again, we have this issue of can we design better, uh, better markets and maybe we can get information and that can lead to better investment in, in public housing. And mark most, maybe most importantly, markets for teachers and schools. These are the very creators of human capital that we want to engender. And so getting the markets for these rights, might, getting these right might be particularly important. So, Thank you again for a great conference, and I look forward to talking with you about this stuff in the future. Awesome. Um, so, Alan. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, I thought that was really interesting. So, the way I was thinking about it, at some level, we think about affirmative action in the context of schools, we can lower standards or we can just or we can lower prices. And you know, one takeaway from you is that if you lower prices and not lower standards, then you don't actually have to lower standards. A little tautological, but that was the point. But then there was this other element to it, which was the outreach to identify those people. And I'm kind of curious, you know, to what extent uh, was this because you were better able to identify the good students? And to what extent was it that you were better at competing for them with other schools? Because in you know, the welfare consequences matter a lot in which box you end up. Yeah. Relatedly, I find myself wondering where the pipeline was breaking down. So where is it that students are not figuring out that they can go to sufficiently, you know, sufficiently good colleges and end up undermatched? Is it, is it finance? Is it just unawareness? Um, related to could, could I actually jump in right here? Yeah. So in my chapter, I talk about a, a really great paper that you should think about. Um, so there's a recent study by Hawksby and Turner where they find that um, there's a lot of high achieving uh, African American high school students that go that, that end up uh, enrolling at colleges that are well below their production possibility frontier given their demographics and their and their achievement level, and so 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 this you know this new research kind of tend seems to suggest that there's there there's just information that applicants themselves lack about what their opportunities are. Um, and so I was thinking, I talked a little bit in my chapter about how you know we should, if we wanted to take a, 
a mechanism like affirmative action and bring it to its full sort of possi possibility frontier, you'd want to like eliminate these information frictions, but then, you know, your project sort of makes it, what I was thinking is, yeah, then we should, we should hire an army of researchers to go out and do this. But wait a minute, colleges have great, have, you know, steep incentives to go and solve this problem th themselves. And so, anyway, I, like, I really appreciate, you know, th this project because it's, you know, it's, it's sort of, the idea is let's get the colleges who could reap the benefits of eliminating this information friction to go out and, you know, pick the low hanging fruit themselves. Awesome. Okay. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. Uh, I don't know if you currently do this, but you should definitely collect the second choice data in order to address some of these kind of efficiency concerns. Uh, and then, uh, related to Brent, uh, Brent's talk, uh, there's another margin which is what are the admissions criteria? So uh, we worry a lot about excessive kind of over investment into counterproductive activities, perhaps certain leadership activities or other extracurriculars or studying for the SAT too much rather than learning other more, much more useful things. So I was wondering whether that could also be thought of as a market design problem. So um, that's a very interesting question. And it's, uh, so in the, in, the, in the theory paper with Aaron Bodokri, we kind of talk about how that's probably not some place that you really want to go. Here's why. So when I, when I showed the first order condition, you see those two pieces where Becker and Spence live, okay? Now, if I'm a social planner, I love Becker and I hate Spence, right? You know, Becker gives me just, you know, socially productive in production of human capital, and Spence gives me wasteful overinvestment. And so if I am, if I'm a social planner and my narrowly tailored objective is just to maximize market surplus within the college market, it turns out that my optimal mechanism is a sort of Jim Crow law where I, I take minorities and allocate them only to the lowest quality colleges and non-minorities and allocate them to the best. The reason being is because I hate Spence so bad, I can take race as a noisy signal of cost, and I can and I can partially shut down the wasteful overinvestment by you know by breaking apart the competition in this way. So you know this this poli this is not something that we see as a policy prescription. Really, what we see, <laughs> really what we see this result is kind of an indication that in in the real world there must be some other you know like. Real world social planners must care about something other than just narrowly tailored, integrated, you know, uh, surplus within the college market. So, you know, social objectives like inequality as or equality as a good in, a, in and of itself, and then maybe spill over human human capital spillovers to the economy as a whole. So, John asked the question, you know, what if I just adopt the objective to maximize human capital production? <clears throat> so it turns out that. Uh, in a lot of cases, in a lot of very non-pathological cases, uh, if, if your objective is just to maximize the stock of human capital in the economy because there's spillovers elsewhere, well then you strictly prefer a quota system to a colorblind system. The reason being because, so once again, in the minority group, high cost types are decreasing investment, sorry, high, high cost types increase investment, low cost types decrease it. And in the other group, talented kids increase investment, less talented kids decrease investment. The thing is that in the minority group, the most, uh, the most populous group is the high cost kids that are increasing investment. Likewise, in the non-minority group, the most populous group, the subgroup is the low cost kids that are also increasing investment. So, so this affirmative action thing is actually going to increase Spence wasteful over investment, but you know if there's spillovers elsewhere and you really just care about maximizing human capital, then you you most likely strictly prefer some form of human uh, affirmative action to a colorblind scheme. Cool. Uh, I think maybe let's pass it back to Alan after that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I, I wrote down four questions. Uh, that I thought it uh, were really uh, interesting for me to respond to. Uh, 
and one observation. Um, I have to say that I had, uh, and I really appreciate drawing your comments because I had never uh, made a connection in my mind between our initiatives and affirmative action. Uh, and of course, it is a form of affirmative action, in this case for low to moderate income students, uh, but with a whole bunch of boundary conditions, right? About not lowering standards and things like that. But I really appreciate that that observation. I really want to ponder, uh, you know, some of the implications of how to think about that. Um, Avi, you asked about uh, why we seem to be doing better than some other places in attracting the high talented lower students. I I think. Uh, it's a kind of first mover advantage, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I think most institutions are not using this kind of strategy, at least among small liberal arts colleges. There are a few that are, that I'm aware of. Bassard is pretty heavily at Amherst. Uh, Cadenson and Evan Adler, the four that I know a bit about that are, that are doing this. I'm sure there are some others who haven't really vocalized this kind of strategy. Uh, we are thinking about how do we expand our financial aid as much as possible. Most other places like us are thinking about how do we control and optimally lessen our financial aid. So they're in a kind of a different mindset about it. Uh, Scott, you asked about where the pipeline is breaking down. We're, in all honesty, we're, we say low to moderate income. We're doing much better with low income than with moderate income. Mm -hmm. And I think part of this is that the story is a little bit easier with lower income students. Uh, they know that they're disadvantaged. Uh, plus, they have advocates, right, in Kip and Posse and, and dozens of other institutions. There are very few in any organizations like that for middle or moderate income kids. And those kids, you know, in America, uh, this thing, well, we're all middle class, right? And so if you know, if I come from a family making $75,000 a year, there's, I'm not going to think of myself as disadvantaged. I'm going to think of myself as a middle income kid, even though I'm also at the same time thinking about when these, these expensive places are just sort of out of reach. So part of this is an information and advocacy problem, and part of it is a storytelling problem, right? But we, we don't have the right rhetoric. Uh, Brent, you asked, uh, mentioned the thing about uh, Hoxby and Kerner uh, with the high achieving uh, African American students that enroll uh, down the street, yep. lack of a mm -hmm. less polite word, uh, more polite word. Uh, yeah, I think that that's one manifestation of that, but it makes me think about um, th this is actually not as easy as you might think because there are some number of students, I can't quantify how many, who are high talent, but don't want to have that best opportunity. And so they don't even put themselves into this game, even though you know, I don't want to uh, distance myself from my family. Uh, you know, in the vernacular, I'm afraid to leave the home. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that I have talked with several of our students about uh, is some of the social consequences that they face of uh, coming to a place like Franklin Marshall. And it, it, for not all of them, but for some of them, it distances themselves from their families of origin in very uncomfortable ways. I so it socially distances them. Well, and, and affection distance yeah, yeah, yeah. too. Uh, this happened to me as a first generation student who was white, middle class, and Anglo, right? <laughs> and so if I say, what about if they're not Anglo, not white, and not middle class, you know, it was 
that was kind of severe for me, and so I have a lot of empathy for those uh, kids. And I, I don't think we know that much about how strong that effect is. And finally, uh, Andre, we're always looking for information about what the alternatives look right? Interestingly, we have focused more on the students that turn down our offer of admission, and we want to look at where do they wind up going so that we can try to improve our competitive. But, but you're right to say, you know, arguably there's an equally valid thing to look at who we defeated. One of the weird things about our location is we have about seven colleges that we have ridiculous overlap with uh, in admission. And uh, they're mostly in Pennsylvania and Bucknell, Lafayette, Northport, Haverford, Bryn Mawr, Dickinson, uh, Gettysburg. Uh, you know, guidance had a version of this problem, right? Places, uh, you know, if, if you don't have a really, really, really strong brand uh, distinctiveness, uh, you know, you're going to have, many places are going to have a version of this problem as well. Uh, but those are all great. You know, thank you very much for all those thoughts. Thank you. Um, so John, we didn't really get any chance to question you. I really appreciated how in your discussion you managed to take us sort of seamlessly, you know, sort of bring all sorts of really awesome comments out of the papers to our current joint work. So the question for you um, <laughs> is that, so in a, large, in a large market limit game, uh, you know, with ex ante investment and, uh, you know, sort of uh, network externalities, uh, you know, what sorts of things do we think we can say about strategy purpose? <laughs> no, um, let's thank all of our speakers and discuss it once more. <laughs>